Hello, this is Raimu. Welcome back to my introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. Today we're going to talk about closures. So to explain what a closure is, I'm going to start with an example where we're taking some numbers and we're iterating through them. I've broken it apart here into the various pieces. So we start with the array and we wrap the array into an iterator and then we use the iterator to loop over them to print out the numbers. Let's introduce some kind of change to our numbers as we're iterating them. And here I'll introduce a new function. So we're going to have let multiplied equal nums dot map double. What is double? Double's a function that takes an integer and returns an integer, basically doubling it. I forgot to put that there. And I forgot to put nums as iterator then. So what exactly is map? Map is a function that's provided directly by the iterator trait, so sort of inherited by any implementation of iterator. What it does is it gives you a new iterator that internally will iterate the input and apply every item of the input to a function and it takes the output of that function and that's the output of the new iterator. So in this case we're taking the numbers 1, 2, and 3, running it through a function double so as we expect if we run this we should get 2, 4, 6. So we could make another function, call it triple, instead multiply by 3. Substitute here triple, run this, and we get 369. But what if we wanted to have the code call either double or triple depending on some other variable? So to do that, I need to introduce the concept of a factory and a function pointer or a function type. So imagine that we could have a function called make multiplier that took as some input like x, and then here's where I'm gonna introduce a little bit of new syntax here. So a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. This type, maybe it's better if I take that out and define it separately. Multiplier function equals that, and then we can put it here. Maybe this is a little bit easier to read. And let's fill this in. Say, let's say, for example, match x. If it's a 2, it's going to be double. 3, it's going to be triple. Unfortunately, we have to cover all cases, so let's just say for any other case, it's unimplemented. So this is a special macro that comes with Rust that you can put as a placeholder for if you just haven't implemented something yet. Um, others you could put in here are unreachable to say that it sh should be impossible to reach this point. Or you could put to do, which you might have seen before. It's sort of a placeholder that we haven't yet written the code for that. But we'll make it unimplemented, basically to say that, hey, we haven't implemented all the other cases yet. How we might use this is put it down here and say make multiplier 2. Let me close this part so it's a little bit easier to read. So when we run this now, it's 2, 4, 6 if make multiplier is given a 2, and if we give it a 3, it's 3, 6, 9. And if you give it a 4, it's panic, not yet implemented. So how do we solve this problem? We know we can multiply two numbers if we just had a way to put in an x there. So to the cut to the chase, one way you can do this is with a closure, where you take some n, and you say n times 2, for example, or 4. And run that, and we get 489. So what the heck is this new syntax with the vertical pipes? This is a closure. So to explain what a closure is, I'll work a little bit backwards to explain it. Let's first put back in our multiplier factory and then instead of this multiplier function we'll put in a new syntax here we're going to use this impl keyword again but instead of lowercase fn we'll use uppercase fn otherwise it looks pretty much the same and then instead of this match we'll put that closure that we saw and and instead of a literal number we'll actually have an opportunity to put in our x here and then one thing we have to do in this case is add another keyword called move now let me explain a few things about what I did. This move we needed to put in here because this x is actually an, a value owned by the factory function. If we want it to be owned by the closure, we need to move it in. What is this impl capital FN? This, like you might have guessed, is a trait. Now we've seen traits so far when we talk about generics, but in this case it's not exactly generic. In the return position where you have impl and then some trait, you're basically telling the compiler that this function is going to return something which implements the trait, but that something is a single concrete type that the compiler will need to figure out by looking at the program. Now I haven't yet explained what this trait is and what the heck a closure is. So working a little bit further back, let's explain first what the closure is. This is a special syntax 
which internally expands to be something similar to the following. If we take our multiplication function and turn it into a structure and actually give it the state x, if we imagine that the multiplier function has some kind of function in it, let's call it call fn, that borrows self, and then here's where we have the position for the n, and here's its return value, and we simply say n times self dot x. Now you might start to see how this syntax kind of makes sense if you think of it in terms of an expansion into an anonymous type that has some state in it. What this syntax means, along with the word closure, is an instance of a function which closes or captures variables around it, in this case the x, and turns it into some kind of object with an associated function. So in this case, it captured the value of x. We had to put the move keyword in front because by default in Rust, things are captured by reference. If I remove this move here, you'll see that we get a compiler error. It'll say that to force the closure to take ownership of x, use the move keyword. The more explicit explanation is that, like it says here, the closure might outlive the current function and it borrows x by default. Rust borrows variables it captures into closures, but it's owned by the factory function. So it's technically a borrow checker problem. So putting the move keyword back in there overrides the behavior of Rust when it comes to closures, and it says that anything that it captures or closes around to make that function, it should move into that function. So this function defined by the closure is taking ownership of x. If we try to use x after defining this closure, we would get another borrow checker error saying that we already moved x into the closure. We can't use it anymore. So to touch again on this impl trait syntax and what this trait means, as you can tell, it, lo it looked very similar to the type of a function or function pointer. The difference here is that, as you've learned before, traits are implemented by types, so they are interfaces for actual values. In this case, the value would be that anonymous structure that contains the captured variables that the closure collected from its environment. The trait itself is specifying that the interface to this object is that you can call it like a function, that it gets one argument and returns one value. Now it happens that all lowercase fn's implement the uppercase fn trait automatically as long as their arguments in the return type match. So we could, for example, have put in double here, and that works just fine, only we're not using x anymore. So let's go back and put that back to the closure. Now as I mentioned before, this is not a generic placeholder for type. It is actually a placeholder for a single type. To illustrate this, what if we put some code in here, say like x, if x is greater than zero, have one closure, else have a different closure, even if we had the exact same closure, Rust will say that the types are incompatible. Even though the two closures are identical, they don't have the same type. Now, another way you can think of it as, like it's kind of showing you here in the pop-up, even though the content of the closures are identical, if you consider the line numbers in the files in which they're defined to be part of the makeup of the type, then they're of course not the same because they are on different line numbers. Now, we could have this return double or triple if we wanted, because those two types are identical. They're both concrete functions that have the same signature. Now a couple more nuances to closures that you're going to need to understand. There are actually three traits that closures can implement, and they're all supersets of each other. So capital F lowercase n is the most encompassing trait, so all closures implement this trait. The smaller set within that is the set of closures which can mutate their state. So let's say, for example, that in addition to multiplying by x in our closure, we also incremented x. And to do that, we would have to make x mark it as mutable. We're going to see this error that we can't increment it here because it's captured in fn closure. So we have to change this to return a mutable closure instead. This basically is the same as if we had this anonymous function have a different kind of function where it can mutate itself. So an even smaller subset within function mute is the function once. And that is the case where you can have a function which can only be called once for some reason. Now, to illustrate that, let's just make a token type that doesn't mean anything, but I'm just going to use it as a, a way to illustrate that what if we had some extra value here, a token of some type, and we move that into the closure, and inside the closure we consumed it. Basically drop that token, right? We're going to get an error that we can't move it out because it's captured inside of an FN mute closure. To fix this, 
we move to the even more restrictive type Fn once. The error goes away. The consequence of this, though, is that this closure can only be called once. So even if down here we added our token, we're still going to get an error that it expected a mutable closure, but it got a once closure. And it makes sense because this iterator is going to need to call the same closure function for every input. It can't do that if it's given a closure that can only be called once, right? But there are lots of cases where you'll have closures that are only meant to be called once. These closures have the most flexibility. And just to illustrate, a function once is similar to if we had added the token up here as part of the state, and then inside of here, if we had a once function, if we tried to drop the self token, we would have a problem because we can't move it up because we, we have the self by mutable reference. So the real equivalent to fn once is if you consume the self. And as you might expect, you can't call this function more than once because it, the function owns self and it essentially consumes it because there's no way to get it back out. But it does allow you to do things like dropping part of that self. So hopefully that gives you a taste of closures, function types, function traits, the various differences between them. I know there's a lot more to cover about them. They can be quite confusing. I purposefully kept this brief as just an introduction to it, but we'll see a bit more of it in the future. Now, so far we've been writing programs that only operate within their own little world. In the next video, we're gonna actually interface it with the real world, talk about input, output, error types, program environment variables and arguments. So I hope you join me for that next video. See you soon.